Hello again, everybody. This is Derek, and I am coming back at you with another Wargaming and Miniature video. Today's video is our Wargaming Weekly. Uh, what I try to do, and it doesn't, doesn't always work out this way, but what I try to do is have a video once a week where I go live and I'm able to interact with my community as well as work on uh, projects that I've got um, on my table. Now, I'm not gonna be able to just jump right into uh, painting. Well, actually I can, but I have uh, not finished my lunch, which is right there. It's only got about another five or six bites and then I'll be done. Um, there we go, got that out of the way. And, but, um, what, I'm, what I need to do is do a base coat on all these guys. Um, I did the initial primer coat. Uh, and I don't mean base coat, but I mean like um, brush primer is what I need to do. Um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna pull all these figures off of this board so I can get this board out of the way. Um, this is a Old Glory 15 millimeter uh, starter army for Field of Glory. It's the Republican Romans. Uh, now we're not playing Field of Glory, but a Republican Roman is a Republican Roman. So what I plan to do is base these up for Mortem et Glorium, which is uh, Meg for short. And I was showing off the Meg Army List uh, PDF at the very beginning. Um, okay, so just a little disclaimer, the triarii that they give do not have any spears, uh, they just have hands, right? But they provide these 90 millimeter rods, little brass or steel rods, um, for pikes, sarissas, spears, whatever you need them for, right? And looking up the Triarii spear, I saw that it was only, it was less than seven feet, right? It was, uh, they, I think they said two meters, which is 6.8 feet or something like that. So, so I just said, screw it, We're, because it's a miniature game and I want it to look uh, epic, I decided to make them uh, bigger than 15 millimeters because uh, 15 millimeter represents approximately six feet in this scale. Uh, so Romans in this era being five foot eight on the average are not six feet, so they're actually, they probably should be 13 or 14 millimeters tall. Um, yeah. Um, probably 14 millimeters. So what I did was I took the spears and I cut them down to over 20 millimeters. Because remember, they come as 90 millimeter poles 
and I so I cut them into thirds. So it wound up being like 20 and a half, maybe 25 millimeters, um, which makes the spears longer than they're supposed to be. But I, but they still, you know, on the figure, they still look short. So I, um, if I had actually cut them down to maybe 15 millimeters, they would be, they would be, they would disappear. It would be hard to see. So I, uh, I decided to cut them at about 25 millimeters. Something like that, right? Because that would be 60, 75 millimeters. That'd be 75. Well, it's actually, I cut it into thirds. So I don't think they're 30 millimeters each. I don't think it came out exactly like that. Um, might be 27 millimeters, something like that. But okay, well, either way. Um, so that's, but because of that, uh, they give you one of these rods for every two figures. So, uh, that wound up meaning I've got a few extra rods. Um, okay. So now these are leftover figures from organizing the army into... A Meg army. Um, I could very easily have based. The, there should be twelve figures in here. I should very. These are all Principe. I could very easily have based these, uh, primed them, and painted them with the group. But I decided against it uh, because I've got so many other Romans that I need to paint as well. And this is only about a third of my army, so. Yeah, this, it actually is close to a uh, Magnus army. Uh, if you're familiar with, if you're familiar with Meg, then you would know that there are three levels of armies. There's the Maximus, the Magnus, and then the Pacto. Uh, and all that all that really means is Maximus is a full army. Like that's the big army. That's where you spend like 10,000 points or whatever and you can get this giant army, right? A Magnus army is two-thirds of this army. So if you had six cohorts here, you would have four cohorts here. And then Pacto is one third of Maximus, right? So you would have six, four, and two. Uh, okay, I just saw my camera. Okay, well, I'm going to leave it on autofocus and say, fuck it. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm not, I'm really not ready to get started, uh, but I think what I'm going to do is, oh, and you can see that these guys are super glossy. Yeah, these guys are super glossy and I don't want that. Um, I looked at my two primers that I was going to use, both being Rust-Oleum. And uh, one of the primers was dark brown, and the other one was brown. And then uh, I didn't realize this until I got out there and started spraying that the brown was flat brown, and the dark brown was satin. Okay. Uh, so I thought about going back over it with with uh, the flat brown, but unfortunately to me, looking at it, the flat brown seems too light. Um, kind of like this, right? Um, kind of like this, and I didn't want my undercoat to be that light, I wanted it to be dark, maybe even darker than this actually. 
Um, I did. Ha I do have a something called a walnut, uh, a dark walnut, which I think I've got a walnut over here. Yeah, I've got a dark walnut spray as well, which is probably perfect. But it was also satin, and I was like, crap, I don't want to use that. So I busted out my folk art and deltas and all that. Burnt umber uh, is like a really dark brown. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint this over this. It's going to make it flat. And more importantly, it's going to... It's going to fit into all these, when I brush it, it's going to fit into all these areas that the spray did not get into. Okay, so that's what we're getting ready to do. I'm going to do that here momentarily. Um, now, um, normally on Sundays... I film a video that I record and update and then I send out on Mondays so that everyone in the store, anyone that subscribes to my channel and shops at my store will know like what kind of new product I've been getting in and what kind of supplies I've been getting in, etc. Right? And what kind of projects I'm working on and what I'm finished and what I've started. Okay, yeah, this... This uh, focusing is starting to um, bug me to the point that I cannot handle it. Really? Huh. I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder why it had like a little bit of a. I'll leave it like that. That looks good. All right. Advanced. Focus. Autofocus. Turn that shit off. Yeah, I'll leave it right there. There, okay, see that's blurry. No, it's not. I went the wrong direction. That was pretty clear. That's yeah, clear enough. Okay, so there. Now that focusing won't like uh, make me have a anxiety attack. Okay, so so I. I started working on my commission, the Romans, not the Romans, the um, Russians, right? Um, I have a customer that has some Russians that he sent me, uh, basically the entire Russian starter army. Uh, and there's like 150 figures in there. And... Uh, I got to, a, I, I, I started assembling them and trimming them and it took me all day just to do the torsos and the backpacks of the line infantry, right? I went through and did the 150 torsos and backpacks, trimming and scratching and getting rid of all the mold lines and you know etc etc right plus there's some metal in that pack so i had to wash them and but they're not clean yet though i mean they're clean but i haven't gone through and cleaned off any of the mold lines or anything so the so the metal are are washed the mold release or whatever is washed off of them but they're not they're not ready to be glued together or anything um and then by doing all that and by filming the what's in the box video, and you can watch that, that's, that's on my channel. Uh, by filming the what's in the box, the, um, 
it came to my understanding that um, there were no command elements for the hundred models of line. There was a command set for the Pavlov Grenadiers, but not for the line infantry. And um, I didn't, I don't want to paint the line infantry. Uh, I mean, I can continue to assemble them and get them ready, but I don't want to start painting on them until I get the command in because whenever you paint in a batch, and that's why I've got this huge group right here. That's another reason why I got this huge group. When you paint in a batch, uh, either the primer is a little bit different or the, the green that you used. Maybe I use this green when in another batch I use this green. And so when you go and you uh, put the two units side by side, they do look slightly different, um, which is a good thing because that gives them unique, um, what is it called? Unis, uni, Unicentri century, uni, unicentricity, I think that's what it's called. But what it basically means is each unit will be unique. And <clears throat> so that's, that's great. Now when, um, if, hypothetically, I went and I, <clears throat> knowing the colors that need to go on these Russians, if I go ahead and paint all these Russians and then put them on the shelf, waiting for these command elements to arrive and then I put the command elements down and I paint them when I go to put them in the units there will be a slight difference between the command not always especially if you've got everything locked down but maybe you I used a dark wash on one group and a strong wash on another and without, you know, without um, realizing it or, or whatever. And what will wind up happening is, uh, and even if you write all the colors down, uh, just the way you mix them in your palette, or uh, it never comes out exactly the same. That's my point. So, uh, so I don't want to do the command elements in a separate batch from the infantry that he's provided. Plus, uh, it comes with four battalions of 24 with no command. But as soon as you add command, you now have all these extra bases that are not part of those four battalions. And so I asked him to get me five command stands so I can make five battalions. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be a thing. It's going to be five battalions plus the Pavlov Grenadiers, which is a large unit. It's a lot of freaking models. But I want to do them all in one batch. So I put them back in their box, you know, half assembled, waiting for those command elements to come in. As soon as they come in, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. That's going to be done. Okay. So in the meantime, because this is what I'm trying to get to, I, I'm beating around the bush. So in the meantime, what I've done is I've received a Old Glory order, which had this Roman starter army in there. So I said, you know what, let's go ahead and knock out this Roman starter army. Maybe one more row. Yep, there they are. Let's go ahead and knock out this Roman starter army. Uh, it shouldn't take me that long, and I'll probably have this finished before the command elements come in. That's what, that's what I want to do. And I haven't, uh, I've painted so much World War II over the last few months that I need a break. So, 
and plus I've gotten everything ready for Canada's Crucible, which I let some of my local players know that uh, we can get started on the Canada's Crucible at any moment, at any time. So I let them know that if they want to participate in the Canada's Crucible, all they have to do is let me know. That's right, I'm using one of those. I'm not using the power. Because this is going to be a lot of, a lot of, that's what it's going to be, a lot of. Okay, so, and I think that's a good brush for that. Number 10 brush, that's gigantic. But okay, so, uh, before we get started, uh, what happened to my... There we go, got that other one. Uh, so I also received in that uh, Old Glory order, really there was one thing that I ordered specifically and all the other things I threw in there as filler. This was actually thrown in as filler. Plus I wanted to see exactly what you get in a bag. And so I, I did record a what's in the bag for this. Um, but it has not been edited and uploaded, just so you know. But in addition to that, I got in a ton of Prussian Napoleonics, all 15 millimeter Prussian Napoleonics. And uh, I'm going to put them on the shelf, put them away. I don't even have a tub for them. Um, I'll probably put them in the Allies tub, you know, the, the Brunswick and Nassau's. Just to get it, I don't know. I don't really have a spare tub to put them in. Actually, I might actually have a spare tub. But either way, I got them in a box. And I'm going to put them off to the side. I got some Ulans, some Lancers, which is pretty much the same thing. Uh, Hussars, Generals, Artillery. I got some Landveer, some Silesian Landveer some line infantry, just a smattering really, like one of each unit. Um, just so when I, just, just a, they, it was filler for this order. And then um, lastly, the whole reason for this order was these two bags right here. These are Battle Honors 4087. These are World War II limbers, two horse limbers. Ooh, I was about to sneeze. Okay, I hear somebody outside. I wonder if it's the mail. Uh, it might be across the street. Hang on. I'm back. Um... OK. 
Okay. Oh, I'm gonna sneeze again. Ah, I'm gonna let myself sneeze instead of trying to hold it back. Okay, this this was one of the orders that I was actually waiting for. Um, not before I get started on these guys, but before I actually put pen to paper on the uh, Russians. And also I was restocking on some missing items. Uh, not missing, low, low items because I go through a ton of paint. It's a fairly small order. Naked, huh? No. Um, whenever I put an order with these guys, they always send me a $100 gift certificate for Naked, which is a winery. I don't know. N Naked sponsors them. Okay, so I got some more AK Ultra Matte. Uh, this is the new new bottle. Yeah, this is the old bottle. This is a new bottle. Um, this is about half full. I just wanted to get another bottle just, you know, so I didn't run out. I also ordered two brushes, which is weird. I don't need them, but I ordered them anyway. Uh, I ordered a Vallejo brush, if you can believe that. Um, I normally don't order a Vallejo brushes, but I ordered a Vallejo brush and a AK brush uh, because I wanted to see what all the hype was about. Um, normally I'm using these Transcend Art brushes, which are really good. Okay, Deep Green. Uh, this is a color I've never had, and I realized I needed it for the Russians. The Russian uniforms are deep green. I was going to use uh, just whatever other green that I've got that is close, but I said, well, since I'm doing like 150 of these models, and this customer is uh, planning on sending me a number of uh, armies and units and uh, it's going to be an ongoing thing I said okay let me just go ahead and officially get the deep green um, now oily steel I've never had either and um, based on this painting guide that was included uh, with uh, with the unit, it recommended using oily steel for the metal, you know, the bayonets and the barrels, and instead of using gunmetal, right? Gunmetal is too dark, and natural steel is too bright. I mean, you can see natural steel right there, and gunmetal is almost black. But looks like oily steel is like a 50-50. It's like halfway between the two. I think that's perfect color. I ordered some more beige brown for rifle barrels for everybody else. Uh, and these are the two colors that I was running out of. So I decided to order them before I was completely dry. And that's Russian uniform and German gray. Uh, I now realize that I really didn't need to order this German gray because I have an army painter color, a war paint, or it's an army, yeah, here it is. Yeah, army painter, war paint, necromancer cloak. It is uh, exactly the same thing as German gray. But, you know, I didn't know that. Until I started using it. Russian uniform, German gray. 
I needed the deep green. That was one of the reasons why I ordered uh, any of this from this company was mainly just to get the deep green and then replenish my three colors that are getting low. German gray, Russian uniform, and beige brown. Plus, I, I wanted to see what the hype was about the oily steel. And just looking at the bottle, it looks awesome. I think I'm going to use that for almost everything. Um, and then I ordered this thing because uh, experiments. You know, just try, try it and see if I like it. That kind of thing. I ordered this uh, new bottle, right? It's in like a... Or it's a new... Um, it's called, it's game color, right? There's, there's game colors that there's, they have, okay, Vallejo has things called Panzer Aces, Model Color, Model Air, but they've had game color forever. It's just that the bottle didn't look anything like this, right? It, it, it looked like, um, it looked like a model color. And I guess that's why they went with this because it stands out but this is a brown it's like a it's a grunge brown and i wanted to give it a shot mainly for like muddy for mud but we'll see it looks good i like it just just glancing at it it's too light for these guys obviously okay so world war ii limbers that was mainly for uh, late war Germans, but it could also be East Front or any time. I just don't have any um, any limbers, and I really didn't know where to get them. Oh, yeah. Okay. Also, I got some high-speed tractors, right? Uh, I don't use this, so trash. Switching to my new eyes. I'm going to mix up a burnt umber. Okay, one of these is thinner than... One of these is... Okay, I think this burnt umber has less paint in it. I thought about... Uh, and I'm probably going to do this. I'm going to combine these two bottles into one burnt umber. Because they're both about half empty. Okay, now I got the sniffles after that uh, sneeze. And going outside. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to brush this on and then I'm going to finish my breakfast. So, I mean lunch. Normally it's breakfast because normally I'm on a lot earlier. Okay. Yep, going to do just a little bit of reconstituting here. Before we get started. Now guys, um, if you can find the perfect color in folk art, I recommend using it. To me, folk art is um, a good, solid paint brand. Uh, it's, what is the company? Um, Pactra, right? No, Plaid. Plaid is the company. They're the same people that do, what's that glue? The hodgepodge? Yeah, and uh, that's a good glue as well. A good uh, sealant. For like terrain and stuff but some people use it on like wall plaques and posters and and uh, what do you call the thing um, puzzles you put them 
I don't know. There, there's people that build puzzles and then they glue them together. Um, and I, I kind of, to me, that kind of defeats the purpose of a puzzle, but. Because put it together and then what I would recommend is uh, disassemble it and then put it together again. I mean, because that's what a puzzle's for. But they, they're doing it for the artwork, so they put it together and then glue it and say, look at what I've done. Or, or they do the, see what I can do. Okay, sorry. <laughs> if you guys uh, chat with me... Um, at any point during this live stream and I don't get to your chat, uh, bear with me. I will eventually get to it. Um, sometimes when I've got my painting glasses on, I can't read what's on the screen. Um, and so what I do is I kind of get it when I can. Um, if I don't get it, uh, I will guarantee that I will get it by the end of the stream. Because I go through all the chats at the end of the screen, at the end, uh, just to see if I missed anything. Now, I've got a paint jar mixer. I never use it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. Um, I bought it thinking I was going to use it all the time. But I never use it because it makes too much noise. Um, and that's another reason why I don't have an airbrush. Um, if there were such a thing as a silent airbrush, I would, you know, with the silent compressor, maybe it just goes, mm, that'd be fine. But if, it's, but if they go, then I'm not going to use them. Mainly because it'll disturb everybody in the house. I'm not the only one here. I've got to be respectful. Today, I am the only one here. My wife has gone to an SCA regional fighter practice. I'm adding a little bit of this matte medium. Um, not a whole lot. I don't want to thin it out too much. But then right after that, I add a bunch of water. See, Burnt Umber doesn't even look darker than that. It looks about the same. What do you think? I think it's pretty much the same. All right, so this will go in my what did I get in. Um, also, I got, I got this in. I didn't even mention it. I got this in, which is a paintbrush set, which I definitely did not need the case. This case is just a added benefit but it's for carrying your brushes yeah and protecting them what is this what is this super small brush over here i got a 40 and a 50 here we go a 20 and a 10 there's a 2 -0. They're not in any order, apparently. Um, this 2 -0 is uh, looks almost flat. Um, this, these two brushes are flat, and they're big, 1 and 0. And here's a 1 and 0, but these are what's called round brushes, so they're big and thick um there's a 50 round three two these over here are what what are called 
not round they're called point brushes great for um, detailing and I've never had this brand before it's called golden maple um, but I thought I'd give it a try it's a test run that's all it is that's all any of this really is um, I, I do a lot of painting experiments so that you don't have to that's a lie <laughs> I do it because I want to do it <laughs> okay for my own personal education and uh, okay this is definitely going to be a two-handed two-fisted I want to make sure I get up underneath um, anywhere that the brush the spray didn't reach um, it is a little watered down and thinned uh, What's good about that is it won't ruin any of the details when it's watered down and thinned like this. But then it might not get in, it might not dry inside those details. So you got to really make sure you work it into the cracks. Now, I'm also painting the entire model with this. Uh, not just the details, but or not just the gaps, because I, I want this color to be the standard on all these models. Plus, it'll flatten it, right? It'll mat matten it, matinee. No, it'll it'll dull it down quite a bit because I don't want them to be shiny. One reason why uh, a lot of times some colors don't like sticking to shiny paint. It's just a thing. Um, decals kind of love the shiny paint, but not paint. And if I brush too hard, I might flick paint all over my workbench or my pants. <laughs> so I'm taking it easy on the whole flick. I probably could have used a soft bristle brush because this is a fairly stiff bristle uh, great for dry brushing but um, I wanted a stiff bristle so that I could get down because it's mass production and so I could get down into all those cracks and crevices uh, without waiting you know now you might be saying well, Derek, why did you prime brown and not like black, gray, or white? Couple of different reasons. Um, it's easier to see than black where all the details are especially on a 15 millimeter model. It's still dark like a shadow. So if there's any, so instead of black, a dark brown will accomplish more for your model. Um, if, uh, I'm painting a lot of flesh, which on the Italians and there, 
a lot of these guys have exposed arms and legs. Um, a lot of them. And flesh tones uh, go very well on top of brown undercoats. Huh. A broom just fell over. There's a ghost. No. I used it uh, last night. I might not have put it up right. Um, if I'm using, like these guys I'm doing right now, these are Velites. Um, they have like a wolf pelt on their back and any kind of hide like leathers or uh, wood or anything like that will will go great on top of brown obviously because they're just another shade of brown um, and then finally uh, well not finally I guess let, let's talk about tunics uh, these tunics are all going to be bright colors like yellow or red or ivory or green or linen, you know, and these are all bright colors and bright doesn't really go on top of black very well. Um, it goes great on top of white, but white is... Um, not a luxury that I'm able to have, so I use brown. <laughs> because yellow will go on top of brown probably in one coat. Um, red and blues and greens. Brown is just a really good base coat. Um, I normally, if I was going to base coat uh, a brown, which I don't always, sometimes they do black. Sometimes, like I'm, when I'm doing World War II models, I will prime them the, the main color of the uniform. So like a German soldier, I'll prime field gray. Or a U.S. soldier, I'll prime khaki. You know, or British, I'll prime English uniform. Uh, even though the English uniform spray is not the color that I want my model, I'll still prime it that color, and then I'll go back in and brush paint the proper color. But when it comes to fantasy models or ancients, I'll prime brown. Usually. Not always. Skeletons, I'll prime usually with a bone color. You know, you get the idea. Now, larger Romans, like when I do the Caesarian Romans, if that's all I was doing and not doing like a whole army, I would prime them with like a gunmetal spray. Because their chainmail will look really good like that. And then I can just put like a dark wash on top of the primer and their chainmail will look awesome. And then all I've got to do is just touch up the, uh, the flesh and the um, tunics and stuff like that. And they're pretty much finished. So uh, like 28 millimeter Caesarian warlord romans that's what i would do now i considered it with these guys i said you know i sh i do that on my 28 millimeters but then i thought about it and i was like no these guys are republican romans which there's not a whole lot of there is chainmail but it's only on the principes everybody else is wearing a tunic 
even the Hastati, um, which are kind of like Principe Light, uh, they, like Principes is the first line soldier, right? The principal, the prime, right? And Hastati is uh, second rank, even though the word hasta means spear. So they're kind of like, they're spearmen, not swordsmen. And so they would be in the second rank. When I say rank, I'm talking about like in the manipular system, uh, you'd have a whole block, like a whole cohort of principes or a maniple of principes in the front and then behind them another hundred men approximately would be the hastati and then when the principes got a little tired or they you know been locked into battle for uh an hour the uh the hastati would step forward and engage the enemy and then the uh principes would disengage they'd back up and what that allowed the romans to do which was kind of a unique thing in their um army which i don't know it just it just seems smart they have uh it allowed their second or the, the principates at that point to rest catch their breath you know uh reorganize get a drink of water you know um discuss what went wrong what went right it gave them an opportunity to evaluate the battle and rest while the Hastati was up there fighting uh, with their spears. It also did a couple of things to the enemy. Um, they were fighting guys that had these short swords and fought with a specific tactic. Um, and the barbarians, everyone that's not Roman, the barbarians would... Um, fight that a certain way. And then when you switch it up by having the spearmen step forward, now they're coming at you in a different way and you've got to adjust and adapt. I'm not saying the barbarians couldn't adapt. They could. But it just, what my point is, it made them do that. It made them adapt. Uh, and by doing that, they didn't get any rest. So the barbarians are sitting out there uh, fighting. Another group steps forward and starts fighting. Now, understand that if you've got a hundred dudes in a group, it's actually more, but if you had a hundred guys in a group, but it's only 25 feet wide, not all hundred guys are fighting, right? Maybe 20 of them or 15 of them are fighting, right? So, uh, So when the second group steps forward and steps in, it's almost like, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? It's almost like they double their forces and then went back to single forces where the barbarians 
have been single forces the entire time. Um, they see this other group step up. They get a little worried. They're like, oh crap, now we're two to one. But you still can only get so many people in a tight, confined area. So when the Principes back up, it basically lets the Hastati go back to uh, normal spacing between their, you know, their files. And the Barbarians, are, they didn't change. They didn't go, they didn't tighten up, they didn't spread out. But the problem is, they're also not backing up and resting. So they, they've been fighting non-stop for over an hour. And if the fight goes on for another hour, I don't know. I, actually, I don't know what the re... Um, I don't know what the timing is of the swapping out of units. But I'm just using the hour as an example. But if they... Uh, if the, the fight goes on for another hour, the Principe step forward, all rested and ready to go, and then the Hastati, who are tired, back up, and then uh, Barbarians are still fighting with their same guys, who are now, like, winded, extremely tired, and if a game system doesn't represent that, then they're not giving the Romans credit for the one thing that really made them powerful. I mean, a man is a man, you know. So you can't say that, like, oh, they got a plus one strength. You know, and these guys got a plus one intelligence. Or whatever, like some stupid shit like that. When it comes to a unit of guys, it's pretty much... It all balances out, right? Romans had some strong guys. The barbarians had some strong guys. The Romans had some smart guys. The Barbarians had some smart guys. Are the weapons different? Maybe. I mean, you know, you got these two-handed clubs and you got these... Uh, pylums and... Spear versus axe and stuff like that. But that's all kind of generic. Except for the pylum, maybe. That was Roman-specific. But like, a short sword is a short sword, whether you're a German or a Roman. It doesn't matter. A short sword is a short sword. So you got to give the Romans credit for whatever made them different. And one of the things was tactics. They didn't just charge in there and say, we're berserkers, so we just charge in and fight. No. I refuse to uh, demean the Romans like that. I am very Roman. Uh, what's the word? I'm a Roman lover. What, 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 Roman centric, Roman, Roman apologist, or whatever. If I was, if I was going to a tournament, I would play the Romans. You know, if I was in a, at a convention, and. 
somebody was running a battle and if Romans were participating, that's the side that I'd want to be on. You know, I don't know. I can just, I can relate to them, I guess. I don't know. And I really liked the um, Punic Wars. And that's, that's what I'm painting for right here. These are mid-Republicans. Um, the Punic War uniforms. Uh, and that's where you get the Principe and the Hastati and the Triarii. You don't get that in Caesar's Roman or the Marian Romans. They, um, it's really Marian, right? Caesar was the beneficiary of the Marian reforms. But uh, basically, the Marian reforms took apart the Principe, Hastati, Triarii's and made them all something called a legionary. And they all had chainmail. And then when the Imperial Romans came around after Caesar, uh, when they went to the Empire, uh, armor started to progress away from mail and towards plate. Um, and you saw... What do they call it? Segmentata, which is basically a banded. It's banded, is what it is. It's like overlapping um, metal bands that go around the body. Uh, and they're overlapped and they're like riveted together on the inside with leather strips so that they become like super flexible. So basically, you have plate armor, but um, but they're not riveted together. They're held together with leather. Um, it was a tech. It was a technology boost, is what it was. And they went away. Now I always thought that this is this is a myth that I busted. Uh, my own personal beliefs were crushed. I always thought that because the Rome Romans, Republican Romans, were in the Bronze Age, that they wore bronze armor and carried bronze weapons. Well, that is not true. They had iron. I'm not sure if they had steel. I think they even had steel. It was like iron mixed with tin. Because that's what bronze was. Bronze was copper mixed with tin. And so tin was like the... Uh, Tin is real is the real hero. But when you mix it with iron or you mix it with copper, you get different qualities. Just looking at these guys up here. I can tell that they're already dull, very dull. And it seems like dark brown and burnt umber is almost exactly the same color. I'm not seeing a color shift. I'm just seeing the, which is, which is fine. I'm not really caring. I just wanted it to be dark brown. And I wanted the shine to be taken care of. So back to, back to the rules. If if I'm playing a 
miniature game and it doesn't take into account the 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 advantages and disadvantages of various armies then what are you doing you're playing checkers so i looked far and wide for a set for an, for a rule set that i could wrap my head around and really enjoy and i've been doing this for years because i've always i've always um loved the sword and shield era right when when i talk about sword and shield that's all the way from ancient greece all the way up to medieval agincourt or whatever right uh, sword and shield uh basically there are people running around they have swords they have shields and they've got armor and they beat on each other senselessly now when you start getting into the renaissance uh you start adding guns or uh shields are pretty much discarded for nothing but great swords i'm not really into that i like the longbow the ballistas and the sieging of the castles and basically the middle ages and the ancient period so i wanted to find a good set of rules that satisfied my itch it had to um represent each army had to have their own unique characteristics it had to be fast fun and playable just like my napoleonic rules that i'm about three quarters of the way maybe two thirds two thirds of the way finished marshals and generals um so in the beginning i started with wrg i don't know if you know who those guys are war games research group you got a name like that the rules are going to be horrible if you don't have an imagination to call your rules something if you can only call it war games research group is the set of rules no that's the that's the group that wrote the rules that's not the rules uh what what is the rules called um dbm dba uh debellus antiquity debellus militarium Debe or which wound up being an antiquity and then the middle ages but there were some rules changes and overlaps and one is actually done a little bit differently than the other one and i think you can play i do not know this for a fact but i think you can play both uh with the same armies like you can play dba with an army and then with a little bit of a modification you can play like let's just say republican romans and then you can play DBM with Republican Romans as well. It's just that the rules are like a little bit different, slightly. Uh, and that became the industry standard back in the who knows when, the 70s. So I got a, I got a copy of those rules and then I immediately hated them. I was like this is not going to do it. 
I mean, it was pretty much the only thing out there. You know, and I was struggling to play. So basically, I just put my Ancients to, to the side and said, screw it, I ain't going to play Ancients because the only rules system out there sucks tit. And we can go into reasons why I think it's a, the worst set of rules out there, but um, but we don't need to. It's not fast, fun, and playable. Um, and it did. Oh, I got so many, so many bad things to say about that set, those set of rules. Okay, so basically, didn't didn't play ancients for a long time. Then I found a set of rules called Armadi. Um, I started playing Armadi in 172nd because that I went I went through a period in my life when I thought everything revolved around 172nd, and I uh, could find almost every army that I wanted in 172nd. The cost was right. The scale was good. I was playing at the same time I was playing a game called Command Decision in 172nd World War II. And it seemed like a good size to play in. So I got a bunch of ancients and built them up to Armadi armies. And I played a few games and I realized, after playing these games, Armadi was great, but here it comes. It was too simple. It was fast, it was fun, it was playable, but it was just too easy. The armies didn't have enough flavor. There just wasn't enough um, differences, and plus the mechanics didn't lend towards differences it reminded me of napoleon's battles which i was big into at the time as well in that you your two forces have an attack and a defense value you roll dice you compare the values done right and that just wasn't enough for me i wanted there to be strategy I wanted there to be maneuver, and I understand that in the ancient period they didn't have a whole lot of maneuver. That wasn't really a thing, right? Uh, you maneuvered the night before, and then the day of the battle you commit. Um, and so I love the whole, uh, I love that. Like the way you set up and then you and then you go at it. But it just it just fell flat. And then there was Armadi 2, which I got into. Um because they promised to fix any problems from Armadi, which I loved Armadi, don't get me wrong, it was a good set of rules, it was fun. You sat around the table, had a you, you could in one night you could have three or four fights. You know, because the games were fast. But it just didn't do it for me. So once again, I took that ar those armies and I sold them. Got rid of my 172nd armies. Even my Napoleonics. I sold all my 172nd. Command Decision, Armadi, uh, Napoleon's Battles. And I started going towards 15 millimeter. But we don't need to talk about scale. We're talking about rules. Okay, so played Armadi for a while. It was okay. Um, but it wasn't that. And I went through a couple of other sets of rules. I don't remember what they are. Um, if I sit and think about it, I might figure it out. But recently, I picked up Hail Caesar, 
And I really like Hail Caesar. Hail Caesar is a good set of rules. It's good. Uh, but the problem with Hail Caesar is the same problem that I had with some other rule systems. It wasn't the, the figures themselves, the 28 millimeter figures, beautiful looking models, great looking units. They're just too big on the table because if I'm trying to simulate I don't know, Gargamella. There's no way I could do that in Hail Caesar. You know, well, let me rephrase that. There's no way I could do that in 28 millimeter. Unless I, I could I do, you know, because of the, the scale of the battles, not the scale in like numbers of units. You know, because I could, you could do, Gargamella with uh, Hail Caesar, you would just have to have less units and say they represent large units. Like, have 20 uh, pike units on the table and say this is the entire army, which it wouldn't look right because the 28 millimeter figures take up so much space on the table, it just doesn't look right. So, so I kept looking. I found Sword Point. Um, okay, back. Let me back up. Before Hail Caesar, I found a system called Field of Glory. Field of Glory reminded me. Of WRG. It, it's written and published by uh, Osprey. So I thought it, it's going to be good. It's going to be fairly simple. And uh, well illustrated. And stuff like that. Well it is illustrated. And it is simple. It's not complicated. And the armies aren't super large. But. It it had a feel to it that WRG had. It, it reminded me of WRG, uh, DBA, DBM, in that it wasn't battles that you were playing. You were playing games. Let me elaborate on that. The only thing that mattered in those games was points. How many points is that unit? You know, how big is your army allowed to be? You have compulsion. You have to take one Principe and four Hastati before you're allowed to have this. Or, um, you know, if you... Get a Roman army, you must have five triarii or whatever, right? And it felt like Warhammer, WRG, DBA, DBM. It felt like the battles were insignificant the games were more important, like play balance. Let's rephrase that. Which is a good thing. Having play balance is a good thing. But not when it's the focus. And army building was important. You have to have so many core units and then you can have these accessories and I, I basically I just felt like it was a tournament based game. But I can look past that because the source books did have battles in them and 
it did have army lists for what who was participating in those battles so i'm like oh okay so this is that's just another way to play and i'm like okay another way to play you're always good to have multiple ways to play so i go to historicon first time ever going to historicon a few years ago um Shoot, I don't remember. 06 maybe? 09? I can't remember. But I went to Historicon. And my, my plan was not to bring any armies. Just to play in the games that were being presented. Right? So, like I played a game. I played some Napoleon's Battles. I played some British Grenadier. Which actually made me go out and buy a set of British Grenadier. But uh, I played in a game of British Grenadier. I played some, some Check Your Six. Okay, so basically I played a bunch of games, but I didn't bring any armies. And I saw that there was a bunch of tables set up to play Field of Glory. And I was like, okay, I'm going to spend an hour or so, uh, you know, between sessions. I'm going to go down there and see what they're doing. I didn't bring an army or anything. I wonder what's going on, you know. So I went down there and I sat quietly watching these players play Field of Glory. And every table was set up as a two-player table, exactly the same. And the players bought, brought their army, and they were participating in a tournament. And I'm like, okay, it's a tournament. I've played in Warhammer tournaments and stuff like that. So I get the gist. Okay, I have a feeling I'm going to run out. I thought I put way too much in here, but maybe not. Or maybe I used the perfect amount of paint. Maybe that's the case. Doubt it. That's never happened before. Okay, so, so I don't care how they're playing because... I already knew it could be played as a tournament or as a battle, right? And this was a tournament, so that's what you would expect. So I'm sitting there, and I'm watching these people play. And it was 99% arguing. You can't do that. This is the way this unit works. No, it's not. The book says I can do it this way. No, you can't do it that way. I thought that because I did this, I could do that. No. Nowhere does it say you can do that. You know, and, and it was just constant. And it wasn't just it wasn't just one table that I sat and heard this from. I was down there a couple of hours. Well, maybe not a couple hours. Maybe an hour and a half, something like that. But I was down there, and I, after about 10 minutes of watching one table, and all I heard was arguing, the first thing that went through my head was, those two guys are dicks. Man, they need to have a little bit of sportsmanship or something. They don't have any of that. And so I'm like, okay, so let me go find another group. Same... Thing. And I was like, okay, all right, all right. I went to another group. Same thing. I sat by about five different games. I think that's about right. Every single game, every single game that I sat and listened to, there was arguments. Am 
Oh, I thought I trimmed that tail, but I guess not. And I'm like, does this game bring out the worst in people? And so I was like, no, it's not the game per se. I'm sure it's the tournament environment. People that play tournaments are just that way. Now, I played in some Warhammer tournaments. I played in some card tournaments. I didn't get any of that kind of bullshit. Yeah, there was there's rules questions. You know, there's like, can you do that? Yeah, I mean, check this out. Oh, okay, cool. Man, I learned something. That's the way all the tournaments I've been in went. Not, you're an idiot. That's not the way it's done. You're stupid. Let me call the referee over here to tell them that you're an idiot. No, it wasn't. I, I just, yeah, I saw the I saw the referee more than I saw the players. Basically, he was going to every single table table resolving issues. For one thing, that tells me something. That tells me the rules are not clear enough for the players to understand the same rule. Like they're reading a rule, one player reads it one way, another player reads it another way. That means the rules aren't written well. That's what that told me. It was too vague or and I, and I kind of found that the same way. That was another reason why I went down to watch these games. Because I played Field of Glory with friends. We never had that problem. But I also set up scenarios. It wasn't a tournament. We never played together in a tournament. And I was the arbiter of the rules. So whether I was wrong or right about the rules, it didn't matter because I was the only one dictating what the rules were, right? And I, I could very easily have been doing it wrong. So that was another reason why I went down to the tournament was to see other people play and maybe get their interpretation of the rules. Maybe I could learn something, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I learned that the that the rules sucked in that it was too open for interpretation and that the people that play in the tournaments are all a bunch of dicks. You know, they were... And I immediately... And, and this, is, this is me acting out, out of emotion... I immediately sold all my Field of Glory um, books. I still have two or three books. I still have two or three books. I kept the ones that I that had a couple of cool scenarios in. Uh, and then something strange happened. This is a, this is a little bit. Uh, off subject, but Osprey slash the guys doing uh, Field of Glory Napoleonics sent me a copy of the game. Uh, I guess it was a beta version of the game. Uh, pretty much finished. Wanted to know, wanted me to play a few rounds and send back uh, my thoughts. I never put together any kind of army, never put together a game with any of my friends. I said, no, I ain't going to do it. If it's anything like Field of Glory Ancients, 
which it was, looking through the rules, I was like, this is Field of Glory Ancients with guns. I was like, no, I don't want to be involved in this. I think you guys are a bunch of lunatics. So I dropped Field of Glory. And then I found other games. Uh, Lion Rampant, which is actually a really good game. But also, it's... It's one of those Osprey mini books. So it's like super limited on what you can do with it. Units are too generic. It's if you're just doing a medieval battle, yeah, it's great. If you just if you don't care, it's it's fine. But it's actually a really good set of rules. I like the mechanics of the rules. I just don't it's just not complete enough. If that makes sense. There is a there is a Lion Rampant 2. I thought about getting it. But then I I had memories of Armadi 2 being uh, supposed to be the answer to all answers to all, all Armadi. And it wasn't. It was just clarifications of the rules. Uh, it wasn't like none of the rules were fixed. So I said, no, I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna get Lion Rampant 2. Actually I still might because I I like that game. It's just This is not complete enough. So um yeah, I think I might have enough paint in that tub. So I uh I got I found Hail Caesar. And I was like, oh, this is great. This goes all the way from biblical period, you know, with Hittites and Egyptians and all that, all the way up to the Middle Ages. And I was like, this is great. That's pretty much what I want. The entire sword and shield period. And it's a really good set of rules. I really like Hail Caesar. I'm going to tell you, I think it's a great set of rules. But in 28 millimeter, which is what I was collecting at the time, it's too big. Any battle that I wanted to play, because remember, I like scenarios. I'm not a point-driven player. I don't like... I've had too many bad tastes in my mouth when it comes to point-driven tournaments. The scenarios that I want to play are all too big for the table in 28 millimeter. Now I considered playing Hail Caesar and 172nd, which is pretty much the same issue as uh, 28 millimeter. It's still too big, so I thought about playing it in uh, 15 millimeter. I did. I thought about it, and I still could if. But my eyes were still open. I'm still looking. I found Sword Point. I thought Sword Point because it had it had a unique mechanic about pushing and uh, initiative, going back and forth and stuff. It had some really interesting. Um, It had some interesting mechanics. And so so I bought a lot of the Sword Point books. And there's a lot of army lists and stuff like that in there. But it kind of reminded me of Hail Caesar. It just, they, they felt like they were kind of the same. Um, which is fine. If you've got a Hail Caesar army, you also have a Sword Point army. Because the basing and stuff was similar, but there was some things that were a little different, like the skirmishers and stuff like that. They based them differently, and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, it's... Plus, it's not designed... Sword Point is not designed for big, huge battles. It's designed for, like, 
company scale, not battalion scale. You get the idea, right? There are a few units here and there, like a medieval skirmish, a few hundred men on the battlefield. You know, not big battles like Bannockburn or something. It wasn't made for that. So I continue to look. And I found this game called Mortem et Glorium. Meg, for short. Uh, it's a fairly new game, 2016. So I was like, okay, what is this game all about? I watched a few videos about it can be played in any scale. You know, the armies, uh, it is point driven, but based on your play style or available space, you can play in three different uh, army scales, you know, Pacto, Magnus, and Maximus. And I was like, okay, well, that's no big deal. I, I really don't worry about that kind of stuff usually. I, I build armies according to scenarios and historical battles, not so much points. So I just ignore the whole point system kind of idea. But if you're designing a scenario, it's good to have points to kind of give you an idea of how balanced your scenario might be or now you understand that the, if there's an attacker and a defender, the point values need to be adjusted, you know, and a good scenario writer will know, you know, how to, how to make adjustments like that. Uh, if it's just a meeting engagement, it's good to have the same points, you know, when you're designing a scenario. So... So I went ahead and ordered it just to see what it was about. I got it in. I got the rule book in. I ordered the dice separately because there's specialty dice that you need for the game. And that's it because that's all you need is a rule book and the dice. Everything else is like a token that you can make out of cardboard or, or whatever. And I was looking at the basing conventions and stuff, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm pretty much, it's pretty much the same as Field of Glory, basing-wise, if not exactly the same. So I was like, if I've got a Field of Glory army, like my English Agincourt, I should be able to play it. And you can. Okay, this might just be wet paint, but it looks a little glossy. I'm giving you a, a second coat. Because maybe I overlooked something. Plus, it could just be wet. But I'm paranoid. Normally I wouldn't paint an army this big in one setting. But like I said, I, I uh, pretty much had a uh, want them all to be um, what's the word want them all to look similar okay well that's going to take a hot minute to dry I'm going to leave 
that brush in the water and take this and just throw it away. Okay, that's going to take a minute to dry. So I'm going to be able to finish my lunch as promised. It is now cold. It's freezing actually. But that's okay. You guys don't care. I discovered a new energy drink, Oxy Shred, right? When I, when I see Oxy, when I, okay, when I see Shred, I'm thinking muscles, like I'm shredded, right? I, I got rip, rippling muscles. That's what I think of when I see Shred. And Oxy, <laughs> I think oxygen, but I also think cleansing, like, um, what is it? The OxyClean or whatever. Um, I I think it's really just. <laughs> I think. I think it's gay. I think it's it's. Uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I think it's um, a power word, like uh, like mega awesome. You know, or extreme, you know, it could be extreme shred or mega shred. That's, that's what I think about when I, when I see oxy, right? So oxy, like an oxymoron. <laughs> uh, so, so I was hesitant to get it because it's, uh, it has the word oxy in the front of it. I was like, Oxy Shred, that's some bullshit. Why well, I don't want to get that. But I went ahead, it was on sale, and they had a coupon. I said, you know what? It's got the uh the first flavor that I got was called Candy Snakes or Snake Candy or something like that. And uh I got it, it tastes really good. No sugar. Um, calories, z oh, excuse me, zero, but right here, zero jitters, zero crash. Uh, vegan friendly, I could care less if it's vegan friendly. Gluten free, I don't even know what gluten is, you know, I don't care. Um, and then it says clean coffee. I'm sorry, not clean coffee. My bad. Clean caffeine. Imagine a clean, smooth, and exciting energy drink that delivers the feeling of 250 milligrams of caffeine, but does this with a sensible 180 milligrams of caffeine. Now that's some clean caffeine. <laughs> uh sense of humor i'm enjoying it energy reimagined no aspartame natural coloring you know there's a lot of good things on this can that i was uh vitamin c full b vitamins Taurine, well, I don't even, is that bull urine? I don't know. Um, good vibes. <laughs> it's in, good vibes are included. I thought, <laughs> it doesn't taste as good as some energy drinks, but it, it doesn't taste bad. You know, it's like, and, what I've noticed is, like, I'll drink a monster. I'll drink a whole monster. And I'll, I'll be like, okay, whatever, you know, I just drank a soda or whatever. It just, it doesn't do anything for me. It, 
And then I do, if I drink two or three monsters, I start going, you know, I start having a heart attack, right? When I drink one of these, I can tell the difference. I drink it and I'm like, oh man, I got some energy. Let's, let's, let's make this happen, you know? So I strongly recommend Oxy Shred. I, I have not had any bad experience. And I, so much so that I got Bahama Breeze as a flavor. I also have uh, a peach mango and a strawberry kiwi. I haven't tried those yet, but I have them. Okay. All right. Having, I don't really have a lot of space on this table. Not now that I've added all this paint. Well, I don't need these browns anymore because I already took care of business. My business has already been taken care of with those browns. We're about to have a Meg discussion. While I'm waiting, I can tell that like that one's still wet and that guy is definitely still wet. So I don't want to mess with any of that. Okay, in the near future, and I do mean like this week, in the near future, okay, I'm dropping my brushes in the box. I can also drop those limbers down there. I don't need that. A flat file. This is a big one. This is... It's about the right size. No, this is um, about six inches. No, okay, I got a ruler right there. Seven inches. Um, I definitely um, grind with this file. I, I leave the file stationary and I take the miniature and I... <laughs> the bases. To make the bases flat. So they sit on bases. That's what I use this file for. Nothing else. Just... The bottoms of metal miniatures. Okay. This. Heavy. Right? Okay. Like I said, I bought the rule book and then I bought dice separately and that's all you need to play. And then I saw the Compendium Edition boxed set. And you'll notice, Plastic Soldier Company. The actual company is 3C Games. Simon Hall, 3C Games. But you can purchase it through Plastic Soldier. I think they might publish it. I don't know. But the Compendium Edition, I decided to go ahead and get it. And when I got it, it came with dice. I'm keeping my other set of dice, so now I've got two sets of dice. And it came with a rule book. So I went ahead and sold my other rule book. Because um, you only need one rule book, right? Okay. It's also the Compendium Edition rule book. Well, my other one was the Compendium Edition rule book. And here we go. Pacto Magna Magnus. Right? Pacto says you can play a game in 90 minutes. And that that kind of lends towards those field of glory tourney or DBA tourneys when you sit down and you're sitting at a three by three table and you just push miniatures and roll dice and see who wins. That's fine if you like playing chess or checkers, right? But I want to play a strategy game with tactics and maneuver. So Pacto is not going to be it for me. That's too small and too fast. The game says 20 or 30 bases. Uh, just this army that I've got set up here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 
19, 20, 21. There's 21 bases just to there. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 46 bases and three generals. Okay, Magna says you play in about two hours with somewhere between 40 to 60 bases. So this would be would fall into the Magna range, which is kind of what I was shooting for was Magna. I'd like to have Maximus or even more, maybe three Magnus, because um, I would like to play some multiplayer battles at conventions and each player having a Magna army. Um, if I had a Maximus army, I could give each player a Pacto, because remember, they're like one-third. But this says play in two hours. Maximus, which is 70 to 100 bases, remember, this is just generic averaging. It doesn't, it's not set in stone. That's just 70 to 100 bases, play in about three hours. So just looking at that, the biggest game that they're recommending is going to take place in three hours. So to me, that's that's a convention. That's a convention game. That's 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 awesome. That's perfect. That's kind of what I like. Um, oh yeah, cards. Yeah, I've also got a deck of cards over there. Uh, I think I do. I think I've got a deck of cards. Because I ordered the dice, the cards, and the rule book. Because those are things you actually have to have to play. Um, all the other stuff you can make yourself. Right? So, when I got the Compendium Edition... Take another bite. Comes with the cards, not opened as you can see. Comes with what they like to call the death dice. Um, there's two of each. That's one player does not need two red dice, right? Um, so this is basically technically two sets of dice. One for each player, if it's just you across the table from somebody else. I thought that was good. They could have easily have just given me one set of dice and make us, you know, share. But they gave me two sets of dice. And I've already got another set of dice. So that's three sets of... It might be doubles as well. But I've got another set. So that's three. If I ever play at a convention, I'd like to have three players per side and they can share dice. Okay, it comes with a bag. This is for tokens and dice and anything else that you need for your game. I thought that was a nice touch. The rule book, hardback. First of all, that's a nice touch all by itself. I'm getting this out because I want to go through the rule book. But rule book, hardback. Not counting the charts and tables, 232 pages. Not counting the tables. It comes with one set of tables. I ordered a second set of tables. Uh, mainly, I ordered everything that came... I ordered almost everything from the box separately before I ordered the box. 
because once I got it in, I was like, oh, I like this. I'm going to. Okay. This is what's called a Pacto quick reference sheet because when you play a Pacto game, you don't have the same modifiers as when you play a Maximus or Magna game, right? So I thought that was weird. You would think there would be the exact same modifiers, but um, what the game is doing for you is adjusting the scale of your army. The two armies, one has 10, 10 bases, one has five bases, but it still represents the same number of troops on the, on the battlefield. Right, and I was like, wow, that's like a really good way to do it. So they they basically make the modifiers modifications for you. Okay, hold on. Hold on, I can't get everything out. I'm crying like a little baby. I don't want to damage anything. I can just turn it over and flip it around, but okay. So here is the Pacto Oh, there it is. It's underneath. And there's the Magna, right? So So I have two of the two of each of those. Which is good. It will help at a convention to spread the spread the love around. This is um, this is kind of like a campaign chart. It's not, but it's kind of like I'll explain it here in just a minute. Pre-battle system. Pre-battle system. This is pre-battle system. Okay, so I got the same thing here as well. So I got the campaign chart, the weather chart, the and the pre-battle chart. Okay. So they, they have a pre-battle system where it's really weird. Um, and I can't speak on this um, super clearly because I don't know all the rules yet. But every rule that I've read so far, and I've kind of just breezed through the rules, I really like them. Um, <clears throat> I really like them a lot, actually. I don't know how much I would use this. Uh, this this pre-battle system, uh, if you and your friend are just going to sit down with a couple of armies, tournament style, and you guys are just going to you don't know what to play. You're like, I don't know what I don't know what scenario we want to play. Let's just pull an army out and go at it, right? Which I'm okay with that. That's that's perfectly fine. This kind of gives you something that once you've got your armies, uh, there's a way to maneuver your armies on this chart. Um, and I don't know exactly the rules, but you and your friend maneuver your armies on this uh, board, right? And depending on where you connect or how it works, I don't know how it works, these will determine what kind of terrain you put on the table, right? Like... Deep water, forest, woods, none, and then you got dense and featureless, open, normal, and you got mountains like this FJ, that's forest or jungle, C is coastal, you know, and it says can move between top and bottom lines. So if you got a group here, you can move to there, which is weird, but. So basically, you move your two armies around, and somehow you determine 
like where the fight takes place and then uh that's the kind of terrain that you pull out and put on the table which i thought was kind of a unique way to do it but i prefer to play scenarios with set maps and stuff like that but um and then this is pre-battle it basically tells you how to read this and how to it's a quick reference to you know how to use it and then it talks about terrain the terrain types and then uh like like orchard uh description it's organized regular plantations fruit and olive trees with regular spacing we all know what an orchard looks like uh and then next to it it says visibility restrictions infantry visible at three bw bw is base widths so uh depending on how you base your armies will determine what the ranges are i thought that was brilliant if i decide to base all my armies on 80 millimeter wide bases <clears throat> that's telling the game that the scale is smaller because the miniatures are occupying a bigger area so because of that like ranged weapons ranged weapons shoot a number of base widths so if you've got a 80 millimeter base wide i mean you got like this you're playing with 40 millimeter miniatures let's say whatever you're playing with and uh well let's use 60 60 millimeter bases and you've got like three 25 millimeter miniatures on there or four uh maybe you maybe you are playing with 80 millimeters three base widths would be 8 16 24 so you'd be able to shoot 24 let's just say um but if I'm playing with 40 millimeter bases, which is what I'm doing, three base widths is only 120, right? And so this says an orchard, if you're within three base widths, you can be seen. Uh, and then cover, any bases shot at when fully within or any target shot at from or through, I guess that means you get cover. Okay, it doesn't say it is a modifier. It just says cover is for any bases shot at when, okay, all that. Special rules. Orchards have elephants treated as rough terrain. Okay, nobody else does. Well, because they're evenly spaced. But if I was to say woods, natural woods, modest den density, Troops visible at two base widths. Any base is shot at when fully within or target shot at through or whatever. Get cover. And SUGS, that's a skirmish uh, unit group, can only shoot two ranks deep. Others, one rank deep. Okay, so SUGS can shoot two ranks where everybody else can only shoot one rank. Okay. But that's woods. Forest would be different. <laughs> troops visible at one any bases shot at and then troops may only shoot or fight one rank deep no wait so sugs cannot shoot troops may only shoot or fight one rank deep so sugs cannot shoot i don't know what that means and they give you a color code and if it's red it's difficult terrain yellow is or is rough terrain good is green terrain and blue is special okay so i don't i didn't mean to go over all the rules because that's what my tutorial videos are going to be i plan to break the rules down in bite-sized chunks and upload videos over the next couple of weeks so there will be a Mortem et Glorium Boot Camp video series. Okay, well, this looks like it's two sheets. I'm not opening it up. Two sheets of tokens. 
These are nice, thick cardboard tokens. I love the fact that they put the backsides of these tokens are uh, grass, grassy, uh, kind of, um, I mean, it, it's actually a picture of somebody's table, it looks like. But no, it's it's like a grassy look. So when you put these on the table, they don't distract. Like, have you ever played a game where you got like a ton of tokens on the table? And they, you know, especially Command Decision. When I used to play Command Decision, we had tokens behind every infantry stand. Uh, and they were color-coded yellow, green, or red. And then we had to place command tokens down and all these spotter tokens and all kinds of tokens on the table. And they look gaudy. They, take, they make the battle look like a game. It takes my immersion away. Where I love having the grass backing, when you got these tokens on the table, even on this side, it still looks grassy. I, I like it. I, I, I thought that was a smart. I thought it was smart. Um, I guess these look like wounds or guys that are dead. Um, and you only need to place a guy equal to or less than the number of troops that would kill a stand, right? So one or two of these and then you're pulling stands off. Uh, the one, two, and three arrows, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I think it has something to do with initiative, but I could be wrong, I'm not sure. But, um, or like winning or losing the battle, or so, like something like that. So when I go through the tutorial, I'm sure I'll figure it out. Okay, now I like the, uh, I'm not sure, uh, see even the back of the cards are grass. Um, I, I like the, I like the idea of putting cards in the game. Um, but I, but I also don't, right? I, I, I got mixed feelings. I don't like games that rely on cards for everything in the game. I prefer to have dice, and I prefer to have units that can do things based on the unit. Not because I have some mystical card that I draw and it allows me to do something. But on the flip side, as an army commander, when you step back, and, and, I, and I think I, I, I address this with my Marshals and Generals Napoleonic rules, I, don't also, I also don't like players that have total control over their units. I think that units, there should be a little bit of a I'm the army general. I'm telling everybody in the army what to do, but that doesn't mean they do it, or they might not do it the way I want them to do it. I love that. And they use cards to represent you as the army general are issuing orders, and they can only accomplish a certain amount of those orders based on like your general quality and the troops quality and stuff like that. So the, the first one on here is ambush one. Um, the one I do believe is, is a movement allowance, I think. I, I mean, I, it's been a while since I've gone through those rules. So I could place a order on a unit and give it a one, and it'll get a one move, right? Uh, now, if you've got units clumped together, like you have what's called a tug, which is a tactical unit group, that would be, think of it like a cohort, 
or a maniple. It's a small unit of like four bases. But if I've got like 16 bases of four co cohorts and I push them all together and form one large unit, I'm not sure what they call that in the game, I can issue this one to them and all four of them can move forward together. I dig it. And there's twos and threes and fours and other things. Um, and I think you even can play them against each other, but I don't really think I like that idea. Um, and I'm not sure what the ambush is all about. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what all the cards represent. We'll have to figure that out when I go through the rules. And we're not doing that today. I'm just giving you a high-end look uh, at what I'm basing for, what I'm aiming to build with my ancient armies. I have a Germanic army that I'm also working on. Uh, I've got like six bases, eight bases already finished for that. Um, what I'm trying to do is make... Uh, at least two armies to start. I all, okay, I've got Macedonians, I have Greeks, I have Carthaginians, which is really the army that I need to work on next. But I've got Romans, Republican, not um, Imperial. Um, what's good about Republican Romans, the Triarii, the Principe, and the Hastati, I could use them as Caesarian legionnaires if I needed to. I could just say all those units are exactly the same. I also have some Italian allies in here. Okay, but I've read a few things. Uh, like specifically the foreword about the author. And... Welcome. So, like, I, I read the very beginnings of this, and I kind of breezed through it. So I wasn't really um, I didn't really ad absorb it all. But I will have to say that Simon has a really good sense of humor. And uh, he, based on what kind of history that he has with wargaming and uh, where he's played and who he's played with, we have very similar, a very similar mentality. And that's one reason why I think I'm going to love these rules. Um, Yeah, right here. Simple mechanism, yet a sophisticated game. Richness of army character. You know, I want that. Interactivity and excitement. Okay. Um, one thing I loved about Napoleon's battles is that you cannot get away. You can't just sit back and not pay attention. And one of the reasons why that is, is because if I attack you, you have to roll dice, and I roll dice, and we compare our dice and modifiers to see what happens. So both players have to be present at the table in everyone's turn. Modern and future proofed. Player support. They have a website. That's where I got the army list, actually, um, which I'm going to show in just a second. Variety is the spice of life, fast and furious, but it's subtle and rich in skill. Skirmishers are in their rightful role. Play with any basing system. So, if you've got it based for one system and you want to play this, you can. Remember, ranges are just based on the base width you choose. Uh, they're talking about the cards. 
And of course, uh, you got one as a one, and then you got Roman numeral one. So I don't know what the difference. You got Roman numeral one, two, three, and four. You got flank march and ambush and all that. I don't know what any of all that means. The dice, each, all the dice. And then it talks about recommended bases, like 28 millimeter. They recommend a 60 millimeter wide base. Uh, 15 millimeter, 40 millimeter wide base. And then 10 and even 6 millimeter figures. Um, infantry, close order, four figures per base. Loose order, three, and skirmish, two. But that doesn't change the width. The width is always going to be the same. Depth will be based on your figures. Um, now, I kind of used a little bit of the Field of Glory thought process in that 15 millimeters is what I think a 15 millimeter rank and file unit should be. I use the same in my Napoleonics and I use the same in my Ancients. Now I've changed from 40 by 15 in two ranks uh, for two bases being forward and backwards to two bases side by side, 20 by 30. So it's still the same. It's still 40 millimeters across and 30 millimeters deep, which is the same as 40 millimeters by 15 twice. But I just decided to put the bases side by side instead of front to back. That's in my Napoleonics. So I, I made a slight change there. But here in the ancient period, I am staying with the 15 millimeter depth by 40 millimeter wide. But then there's loose formation like tribesmen and barbarians and stuff like that. They don't fight in close order, you know, tight shoulder to shoulder kind of deal. So I'm using them on a 20 millimeter deep base, giving them a uh, like a, a larger mob look. Uh, same thing with my skirmishers. They'll be on a 20 millimeter base. Um, but cavalry will be on a 30 millimeter base just because uh, they're, they're a lot deeper. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they say that cavalry and camelry should be three quarters base width. Should be the depth which three quarters of 40 is 30. So I'm right on par. Um, they say infantry should be one half base width. So they say it should be 20, but I ain't doing that. I'm doing 15. Um, I'm gonna do 20s on the me medium infantry and light infantry, but the heavy, heavy, heavy infantry is gonna be on the 15s. Um, and their generals, they say, should be one base width, either square or circles. I'm going to do circles because it makes them stand out as not a combat unit, but as a general. Um, plus, they're supposed to be camps, which I have some tents that I might make. Um, and they say three by two. So that's going to be 120 by 80, right? They give an example of an Alexandrian army right here, um, which is good because that's one of the armies that I'm doing. And then they talk about if you make a Maximus, that's what the army list shows. But if you want to do Magna, you reduce it by this much. And if you want to do Pacto, you reduce it by this much. Um, it's pretty much uh, two-thirds, one-third. And when you go to look at the army lists, um, there's already a Maximus, Magna, and Pacto list. So you don't have to, you don't have to do any of that math. It'll do it for you. Um,
Okay, here we go. This is something I needed to look up, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to look it up, because I was noticing in the Roman army list that it showed Principe and Hastati were in the same group. Uh, they basically, they're interchangeable, which in my opinion, they probably shouldn't be. Principe should have more armor than Hastati, but we won't get into that. Um, but the Italian allies that I have right there are what's called flexible. And I'm like, what does that mean? So here we are. Representing flexibles. Flexible units should have the majority of bases of the majority of the bases. Okay. Of the normal type formation of the troops of those troops and at least one base of each alternative formation. Okay, when deployed, always put the right bases in the front rank to show which formation they are in. Okay. Okay, hold on. So, if they're close, the base would have four figures. But if they're open order, they're going to have three figures. So, I'm going to have a base with four figures in the front and a base with three figures in the back. And that's going to represent a flexible. And then if they go to open order, I would put the three in the front and put the four in the back. So that's just a way to represent how they're fighting. Uh, tugs of nine base... Okay, example is probably what this is. A tug, tactical unit group, of nine bases of tribal, flexible, lowland, Gaelic warriors who were equally adept at fighting in close or loose and should have three to six bases with four figures as close and three to six bases with three figures as loose. Again, deploy them in close formation at the front if operating that way and the loose bases at the front if spread out to fight in terrain. And then it talks about samurai, Vikings, medieval knights, which I do plan to use this exact same set of rules for my Agincourt, my Hundred Years War armies. I've got French, Burgundians, English, and Swiss. I think I was getting Swiss because the Burgundians fought the Swiss quite a bit. Okay. That's actually how the Burgundian... Uh, Faction was pretty much destroyed by the Swiss. Um, and I love to complete an army. If you get the Pacto army from their ultra cast, uh, just get one, it'll represent a Pacto army. By two, it'll represent a Magna army. And get three, it'll represent a Magnus army. And then if you have no figures, get started with the printed armies. And in the back here, they give you, like, here's some Parthians. All right. They also give lowland Gaelic, later Republican Romans. Yeah, I don't think they give me mid-Republicans. And... Here's this must be mixed or or flexible because the front rank has three and the second rank has I'm sorry the front rank has four and the second rank has three so that would represent these four bases or two bases actually in a pacto army these two bases would represent a flexible so if I look over here at later republican see I'm learning I'm I'm learning at the same time I'm talking to you guys uh, that says superior. 
That says average. So let's come over here where it says legionaries, superior, 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 and then down here, average, 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 average. Okay. Are they... Okay. Okay. Drilled flexible. Drilled flexible. And then these are all flexible. Even the average. Oh, okay. I, I, I didn't even notice this. Four and three. Okay, cool. If you have four and they are professionals, you have a talented army commander representing Julius Caesar. Use him as a floating commander to support the three subordinates. Okay. The army has eight tugs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of legionaries representing the four legions. So they're saying these two bases and well I guess four bases would be considered a legion. And a legion is like a thousand guys, right? Okay. Uh, this is the strength of the army. Four are superior and are bordered in blue. No, they're not. All I, I don't see any border on them, bitches. There's no border. But uh, the generals have colors, and those colors represent competent and mediocre. So you have your talented, competent, and mediocre generals. Um, am I going to... That kind of reminds me of... Um, What was, the, what was that game? Hero Clicks, where you got a, a rarity color. What I might do is put it on the bottom of the base, just so it would be disguised. Um, they say color the edge of the base so that your opponent can see. But, I mean, you only have four generals. You can kind of point out which ones are superior or not. Um... Frontals are very powerful. Use the drilled capacity, a good effect to rapidly strike. As your legionaries are flexible, so they can easily fight and train as well. If they go into loose order, just put the three-figure base in the front. Perfect. There are three cavalry tugs, each one with one stand, to protect the flanks. These are single base. Yep, this is a pacto army even says ready-made Pacto Army. So you can see, if you were making a Pacto Army, you really don't need that many stands. Right? And you really don't need that many figures. You could have a whole army as a Pacto Army. Uh, do not try to win anything directly with your skirmishers. Okay. Now the warriors, these are lowland Gaelic, which is very similar to my Germans. I uh, I have them as three on a base, but if they're supposed to, if they're supposed to be flexible, I need to make some with four, because I think flexible basically means heavy or close and open order. I think is what that's supposed to represent this is all cavalry the Parthians cataphracts royal cataphracts horse archers okay royal cataphracts cataphracts horse archers man they got a ton and they only have three generals I don't know if I would. And then here are two battles uh, between the Egyptians and the Hittites. That's a battle around Quadesh. They got Cannae. You got the Second Punic War. Here's mid Republicans.
See, and on line one, it's Hastati and Principe. Drilled close. Velites, Cavalry, Triarii. Drilled close. If I come across to Triarii, one base. Points per base, 145. That's a lot. Well, I guess not. Because Hastati Principe's base is 144 per base. So it's only one point less. But those units are two bases apiece. And it says something about PBS gives them seven cards. And scouting gives them two cards. Tugs to break. So once you've broken this many, the army's gone, I believe. The camp is poor, unfortified. And all the generals are competent. And here's later Carthaginians, which I have. I need to put them together as well. And then all the charts inside the book. Okay, so now I understand flexible a little bit better than I did <clears throat> before today. So my Italians, okay, let's just get this out of the way. Um, I'm going to be working on those later today. Probably not today. Okay, we've been streaming two and a half hours. That's fine. I'm okay with that. Um, I'm going to pull up Italy. You know what I'm going to do? Yeah. Let's move that. Let's stretch that. There you go. Yeah, put it right along my edge. That looks good. Okay, so we're looking at Italy right here. And I'm going to... Now, Italy is not a nation. It's a continent. Or not a continent, I guess. It's... it's um, a peninsula, actually. Uh, you, everybody knows where Italy is. But there were a number of armies that were that were generated from that land. There was a bunch of different kingdoms or tribes or nations. Some rose, some fell. And one of them was Rome. Rome, guess what, was in Italy. Okay, so these are all the different armies uh, you can see that this was actually uh, last updated January 1st of last year. So, But it's fine. This is what I have and this is what I'm using. They might have updated it since then. But you can see all of these types of armies that you could make just from this one army list. I have um, like six of them. I got one for the Middle Ages, one for Ancient Greece, one for... For Africa, I think. One for Germany and Gaul. Yeah, so I've got a bunch of those different uh, provinces or territories. Okay, so if you want to make a Spartacus Slavers Revolt Army, you definitely could. And it shows you what um, years these all took place in. Um, I am personally doing Mid-Republican Roman, which is from 275 to 100. So, um, there's no overlap with the Italian hill tribes. They are much older, much more ancient. So, the Italians that I have over here on the table are not those Italians. They would be... Um, they're not part of the Roman army. They would be like auxiliaries or something. Okay. Um, now you could do early Romans. 
Uh, and then you could do Camillan Romans. Nope. Uh, then you have Mid Republican. Then there's Late Republican. Late Republican, I do believe, is the. And I, I'm just going off of memory, really. And it'll tell me actually as I scroll through. But I believe, and we're going to test my knowledge. I think it's after the Marian reforms. It's when they started using legionaries, uh, and they were all the same. And Warlord Games calls them Caesarian Romans. Right? Yeah. So the late Republican is more like Caesarian Romans, which would be very easy to paint. Just if you were looking at making an army, it's all chainmail. Everybody's got chainmail. So you just spray them with metal and then touch up the flesh and you're done. Okay. Um, and then there's early Imperial Roman and then Imperial Roman. And then the Federate Roman, which I'm not doing that. That's like the Imperial Roman starts to go after Christ. Which is when they all started carrying the square shield, the you know the traditional. That's the early and imperial Roman. Uh, actually, I think it's early imperial. All the legionaries had the square, and then when you started going to the Federate Romans, I think the legionaries started carrying oval center boss. I think. I don't know. Uh, these, okay, let's just scroll through. Creating an army, right? We already know. Uh, general rules. Two generals. Minimum troops. Okay, so it's going to show minimum troops. Uh, points. Allies. An ally must be a minimum of two and a maximum of four. Okay, where allies are allowed. Okay. Where an internal ally is allowed and no contingent is specified, they must conform to the two and four. That's fine. It tells you on the army list. Um, and this is just sportsmanship. Unfortunately, they had to put that in there. As a courtesy, tell them what you got. Historical introduction about why and what this army list is. And then generals. Um, if you have a legendary, talented, competent, or mediocre, and professional or instinctive, I'm not really sure what the difference is between those, but that's okay. Sub-general and allied generals, how many points they are. You can't have a sub-general that is professional legendary. Hmm. You can have an ally, though. Okay, so they have to be talented, competent, or mediocre. Camps, depending on your camp, you have so many points. Uh, one of the reasons, okay, a flexible camp is deployed as a fortified camp when defending and a mobile camp when invading. I didn't know there was such a thing. Okay. Historical notes. Early Roman or Latin. Okay, we're not doing those. Let's, I'm just going to keep scrolling until I get to mid-Republican. Now, you can see right now at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it. Yep. Uh, Maximus. We're only going through Maximus armies right now. Um, I'm not really building a Maximus army. I'm, I think I'm building a Magna army, the one in the middle. Um... And I'm building multiples of that to give to different players. I think Pacto is too small. It's like, it just doesn't have the right feel. It feels tournament-like. And so, so I'm just going to scroll down until I get to Pacto. Not Pacto. Um, Magna. Here we go. Magna army lists. Uh, point values are a little bit different. Great. Whatever. Now let's go to Etruscans, Apulian, I don't even know what that is. 
Brutian, okay, Chameleon. Hey, Italians, okay. And there's Ascensi. I actually have some Ascensi models. Rorari. Ooh, you know what? That that sounds like um, Rome Total War. Okay, sorry. Sam Knight. That just I just like him. Like the name. Mid Republican Roman. Here we are. Okay. Army general one. You have to have one. Sub generals anywhere up to three. Internal allied generals can have one. Okay, camp, boopadoo, standard coastal, whatever. Okay, I don't care about any of that. Coming down here, and right here where it says minimum and maximum, what they're talking about is how many bases, right? Because everything's done by the base. And Hastati and Principes, um, it says you have to have at least eight bases. Uh, I have exactly eight bases of Stadi Principes, I think. Yes, I have ex No, wait, I got... That's not true. I got four... I have 16 bases, I think. Give me, give, give me a second, figure this out. I have... One... Two. I have four units of four bases. So yes, that is 16. Yeah, UG size, four bases. Perfect. I think that's perfect. And this tells me how many points per base. It's not 144. It's only 87. Okay, so that was some that was another army probably or something. They have impact weapons, <clears throat> which I think is the uh, when they charge, they throw their pylums, and then, so that grants them the impact weapon ability. Drilled close. Okay, so drilled tells me that they're on a fifteen millimeter base. Tells me they're on a fifteen millimeter base, and close tells me that there's four models. Um, <clears throat> now, Italian are drilled flexible, so maybe I need to use, maybe I need to put them on front rank on 15 millimeter four across and the back rank on a 20 millimeter three across. I don't think I want to do a 15 by three across. I don't think. Okay, we'll get to it. Um, the rules pretty much say everybody's on a 20 millimeter base, which is uh, I could do that. I could put everybody on a 20 millimeter base and then just use four, three, or two, but it doesn't differentiate. Um, I'll have to put some thought into that, but I really think it's 15 millimeter and then 20 for the open uh, open order. I think it just looks better that way. And I don't know what this orb, and I think it has something to do with um, the tortoise, I think, melee expert. 16 and 2. I don't know what that means. Melee expert 23. Why is that? And then melee expert 22. I don't know what those are. I don't I don't know what those numbers are. Uh next to next to their optional characteristics. Okay, but I have at least eight. I've got 16 on the table. I could field two armies with eight, right? I could do that. And then they're four unit, four figure, uh, which is what I'm doing, four base, um, 
tugs. Now, triarii in a com com in a combined with Hastati Principe. So this is triarii attached to the tug, giving an additional base or alternating one of the bases as a triarii. So you can have a Hastati, a Principe, and a triarii in the same unit. Um, I'm not doing it that way. I'm doing the triarii separately, uh, and there's four bases, which is exactly what I've got. I've got four bases of them. Um, and then the Italian infantry. Uh, I, this is what I wanted to look at. I saw that it says flexible. So that means... Um, and the most bases you can have is eight, right? Well, I've got, I have exactly eight bases of four, right? Um, which just makes them drilled infantry, eight bases. But if I start, if I do half of them in three bases, I'm going to save four figures. Yeah, so um, I've got too many figures for uh, a, a flexible unit. Okay, and they are deployed in either four or six size. And because I have eight, I'm going to deploy them as four and four, right? Because I can't do four and six, that'd be ten, and I'm only allowed to have eight. And I'm only picking that because it, in, it was included in the starter army. Okay, hold on. Um, now, these are upgrades for these. So if I wanted to make my Hastati and Principes, which are these guys up here, if I wanted to make them superior, they would be 122 instead of the 87. But this says I can only do 12 superior. Still, size is four still. So I can make some superior, uh, if, if I was doing like a crazy 56 base army, which I'm not, but if I was doing a 56 base army, right now I've got 16 bases. So no more than 12 can be superior. But that's a point thing. That's not an assembly and painting thing. Even though I was thinking about color coding my armies, I was thinking about like, having each legion having its own color like having a red legion a yellow legion a green legion maybe a blue legion maybe a black legion whatever the decals i've got you know and or maybe i only put decals on the superiors because that'll really make them stand out i might do that just the other ones just have blank like a red shield, where the superiors have the red shield with all the lightning bolts or something. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, now, de between 207 and 197, what is that, 10 years? I can only have four. Or does that mean I can have four more? Yeah, I think it means I can have four more. So I could have all 16 superior is what I'm kind of get gathering. The triarii in a combined unit 
making them veterans. Okay, because this Triarii is already superior. Yeah. See, and this Triarii doesn't say anything about a long spear. Uh, it doesn't say any. They get no special abilities or anything. They get melee expert and orb. Where these guys get shove and shield cover and long spear. Well, shield cover is pretty much everybody. But they get shove and long spear. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to page two. Oh, cavalry. I do have um, two units of 12 cavalry, which is four bases. Uh, two units of four bases. And this says... I can only have a total of four bases of cavalry. So that's, I've got, mm -hmm. one base too many of Italians, too many bases of cav, that's okay, We're, we are okay. Uh, and I only have three generals right now. I'm going to be working on that. I've got a lot more packs that I haven't opened. Oh, I could have elephants. Oh, if it's after 200. I could have... A two-base elephant unit. That's it. Okay. Tribal loose. Well, an elephant's an elephant. Formed loose. Okay, hold on. It's they're not drill. They're, of course, they're formed, but they're loose. Does that mean I'm only putting two figures per base? Oh my lord. Because if that's the case, I got way too many Roman cab. Okay, hold on. I'm pulling the rule book out. Three games. Figures, bases, units, army figures to bases. Troop type, fighting quality, training and formation. 44. I don't know, so it's probably going to be right in here. Meg, me, okay, right here, cavalry. Close is four figures. Loose is three figures, which close, I guess, would be like the cataphracts. So loose is three figures. That's what, okay, that's what I thought. And skirmish is two figures. So. Okay. Second page. This is, I don't know what the dash is here, but these are like optional units, I take it, or allies maybe, because it does say Italian, but then it also says Triarii, so I don't know. I could have Spanish Scutari, Gaelic, Illyrian, is that Greek? Pikemen, right? Um... Numidians, Illyrians, Levies, upgrade Levies to Velites. Well, guess what? I have Velites. And all or none. Four C notes. Okay. Uh, but they have four figure units. I have two of those. Two four figure units, I do believe is correct. Four stands, you know what I mean. Um, allies, oh okay, so if I wanted to, allies means I have to go look at somebody else's army list and go buy them. Okay, so these are not allies, these are, what do they call that? Um, internal allies, these are like, External allies, I guess, what you would call it. But here's the notes. 
Triaria may be deployed separately or combined with the Hastati print space. If combined, the Hastati print space and Triaria from a tug of five form form a tug of five four Hastati and principes and one triarii. The number of triarii cannot exceed one fourth. The army cannot have more levies or velites than Hastati and principes. Okay, so it can't be a velite heavy army, which is fine. I've got four tugs of Hastati principes, so I can have up to four tugs uh, Velites, but I only have two. A study Prince Bay and Tria may be downgraded to represent the unenthusiastic allied raw slave or penal legions. <coughs> they may be downgraded. Okay, I don't know how to do that. Armies must be chosen as Italy, Gaul, Spain, Africa, or Greece, or Asia, reflecting their campaign history. Okay, so... Spanish and Gauls can only be used in Italy. Gaul, wait, Italy, Gaul, Spain, or Africa. Elephants can be used Greece or Asia at any date, but only from 153 in Spain, Gaul, Italy, or Africa. Cretans, Greek, and Illyrians can only be used in Greece or Asia. Yeah, changes from last version increase the number of veterans at the end of the Second Punic War. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, my Italian, if I say I'm in Italy or if I'm in Africa, I should have no problem using my Italian allies. Italian. Celtic Iberians are Spanish, right where they're kind of like southern France area. Iberian. Also in Spain. Lusitanian. Okay, Numidians are African. Hellenistic Greek. Yeah, I'm not using any of those. Spanish are pretty much Carthaginian allies, aren't they? Oh, wait. Later Republicans. Yep. Caesar. Yep, right there. Heavy cab. And everybody's a legionary. Yep. So late Republican is basically your Caesarian legionnaires. And I can use the same velites. Okay. Uh, Marius, Sula, and Caesar must be either talented. If the tenth legion are present, Caesar must be the army commander. Yeah, because tenth legion is different points. They're not superior. They're exceptional. And you can have a unit of four, and that's it. Yeah, a cap, a unit of four, and that's it. Okay, so Roman, oh, wait, they could have like a, a unit of four. These would be from the Cantabrian circle. Cantabrian. They're the ones that like. Yeah, they're skirmishers, javelins, okay. Numidian cavalry, nice. Okay. Where's my Carthaginians? Oh, they're not in Italy. Okay, hang on. 
We're going to look at the Carthaginians real quick, and then we're probably going to end the video. Just so you know. Wait, is it here? It is here. Okay, so which army list would it be? Would it be Germany or Gaul and Britain? No. Would it be Greece and Macedon? No. Would it be Persia, India, or Iran? No. Would it be Spain, Sicily, and Africa? Absolutely. There we go. Spain, Sicily, and Africa. I would assume it would be in here. Well, I mean, that's a Carthaginian right there on the cover, so. Okay, it includes all of these armies. Spanish, Celtic, uh, Lusitanians, late Carthaginians. I think they are considered late Carthaginians. There's early Carthaginians, but that would be the dawn of time. Okay, hold on. And all that says the appeal free, friendly, yeah. Historical introduction talks about the Carthaginians conquering Spain, where we got Hannibal and all that jazz. Uh, across the Alps, Hasrubal with the army to defend Spain, Carthaginians continue to lose ground, all that good stuff. I'm glad I threw in a little bit of history. But let's go to not early Carthaginians. I don't care about you. Late Carthaginians. Magna. Right here. Uh, they could have two elephants. Two elephant units if they get four. They just make them two and two. You could get three and just make one unit. Numidians. African spearmen. Regrade veteran Punic Spanish or well, cavalry as Spanish. There's Scutari, Balearic Slingers, Citizen Infantry, only in Africa. 40 bases. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of them. And they that's 10 units of them. Upgrade. Campanian foot. That's supposed to be companion. No, it's campaign. Campanian. Okay. African spearmen. This is all upgrades. Hannibal in Italy. No more than two elements. Hannibal in Africa. So it would depend on the year. Allies. Yeah, the theater of war must be specified because that tells you right there Italy or Africa or Spain. And I guess if you guys are deciding on a year that you're playing. You're looking at a specific scenario or whatever. Yeah, I got a lot of work to do on my Carthaginians. All right, guys. Well, that is where we are going to call it for the day. I can see that... They're all 
almost dry. I think they are pretty much dry, but um, I don't know how fast I'm going to be able to paint these bad boys. Okay, so we got everything in the box. I will be reading these rules in detail thoroughly and as I uncover rules uh, I will be sharing them with you as a tutorial like we call them boot camps where I go through a rule book and we go page by page so I don't miss any rules but uh, like I won't need to read the introduction and I won't read need to read like what you need to play the game and stuff like that even though that's usually my first video is just generically like hey this is the name of the game and this is what you need etc etc um, but yeah so look forward to some Meg videos in the near future and uh, what I would like to do also is to have some troops finished so that when I go over the rules I can have a table set up with some troops on the table and uh, give you like a visual representation like I do with all my boot camps give you a visual representation of what you should see on the table not like an army but like this is how far they can move and this is when they shoot and when they take casualties and stuff like that and actually do a hands-on with some troops on the table and i don't want to do that with the counters that are included in the book that means i would have to cut my book and i don't want to do that i could just get some bases and draw on them but i don't want to do that either i'm in the middle of painting some figures so let's go ahead and paint them and then we can talk rules explanations once i get some troops now if i have to have romans against romans and do a ooh, look at the brown on my fingers if i do a roman versus roman do like a civil war you know caesar against uh pompey or something I, i'll do that you know but if i have germans i do have a handful of germans but um but once i get these guys done i think i'd like to do a carthaginian group and then once i get the carthaginian group i'll definitely be on the roll for doing that um, while I wait for uh, these Russians to come in because once I get the Russians the Russian Napoleonic uh, command stands then I'm gonna put everything to the side and just do those to get those knocked out for this customer all right I'll catch you in the next one you guys have a great day